Howdy everybody in YouTube land. What we have in front of us today is a Sony Indextron. Now, I've never personally worked on one of these. I've never seen one. I've never touched one. I've never even seen one operate outside of watching, you know, YouTube videos and stuff like that where I've seen people work on these. But I have zero experience with these sets and these things go for a stupid amount of money more than what i can afford i'll i'll never i'll never pay what people want for these people will people do it all the time but it's just not for me I, you know it's it's way too expensive probably because of the rarity but this one however belongs to a friend of mine and it is in for repair so the backstory to this one as far as i know is it's the Japanese model. It's the, the KV-4S V2. And this one was full of capacitors leaking everywhere and corrosive and, you know, the typical stuff you always see on this channel and various other ones. So the, the thing was cleaned up. It was recapped. Wouldn't power on. So a circuit, an IC was replaced that runs the high voltage power supply section. And then after that, it would try to turn on and then shut down and that's it that's as far as we know now this one was bought from japan using the typical japanese websites that everybody else uses now so they're expensive just like ebay is um and the unfortunate thing is the american version of the schematic which is what's publicly available does not match this set it's close but there are some differences, and those differences are in the key areas that we're having problems with, such as the the drive stage for the 50 or 60 or whatever volt power supply that runs the high voltage section, which is all interlinked together and phase locked, and it's, yeah, it's it's a completely, it's a nightmare. So that's where we are with that set. I don't know what the fault is yet, but I'm sure it's probably going to be a bad transistor or open trace or something like that, probably from the capacitor goo. So, um, with, other than that, uh, I don't know at this point, but it's a cute little thing, you know, and the thing, the problem with these sets is nowadays they're a hundred percent novelty because you're not going to use them because there's no more over-the-air analog broadcasts. And even if there was, this is going to be to the Japanese standard, which has a different channel layout than what we have here in America, or had. But 12 volt, 14 watts. Um, this is the charger that came with it. Um, 12 volt center negative, but I don't know. That's weird. It shows center positive. So unless this thing was cut and modified, that is a center positive charger. Um, interesting. Anyway, so this one is a 1.5 amp. I don't know if that calculates to 14 watts. I can't math in my head right now. Ah, let's see. It says, don't clip this. I don't know what that actually means. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's certainly center negative, according to that. It's got composite input, so at least you can use it for something. I can see the fresh caps inside there. Man, this thing is packed. Like, completely crammed. All right, well, let's get this thing apart. It appears the screws are already removed out of it, so let's continue to take it apart and figure out what we got going on inside. This is the first time I've ever seen one of these, so it's going to be an interesting learning experience for me along the way. I got the rear cover off of it and set it off to the side. The speaker wasn't plugged in, so I'm not sure exactly where it plugs in at. Probably here. But, man, this thing is packed. It's like... The most cubiest thing I've ever seen. It's How do you work on something like this? How is it even possible? Sony never ceases to amaze me. Well, the first observation right away is the solder joints on these things are absolutely atrocious. 
because you can see the the, the cold solder joints. So this thing's going to need some work. Definitely going to need some resoldering outside of just where the caps were changed. Um, the only thing I'm worried about is I hope he used the low ESR capacitors in the areas that were required to. Because if he didn't, that could be why it's shutting down as well. Because there's impedance issues with the capacitors. I've seen that before, so we'll see. Well, it looks like... That is so funky. I have not... It's like a black and white picture tube. Which makes sense, because of the way the Indextron technology works. There's the sensor up here, which is what that is. That is, that is so crazy. Alright, well, let's keep disassembling this thing. Look at the ridiculousness of this. You can't really service this. This is, I like the thought where they did this hinge thing, but you can't, this is, this is horrible. How do you, there's a board here, then a board there, then these two boards, they're wings, and then this has to get moved out of the way. I already removed the top piece, and that thing was eat up. So you can see where he cleaned it off and changed the caps. Now this, yeah. So, let's see, does this come out of the way? Yes, it does. Oh, well, we have an IC there that looks like a power supply or audio output or something. I don't know what that is. It's mm, such a strange design. There's the flyback lead. I think that's the circuit board at which the chip was replaced on, but I don't know. Flyback transformers and that cover there. Oh, not fun, not fun at all. Okay, well, let's keep disassembling this thing. Alright, after fighting with this thing and fighting with this thing, I got it apart. Uh, yeah, this thing is not... Uh, okay, I admit, Sony probably tried to make it serviceable, but it's it's not. It's just you can't. <sighs> Anyways, um, so it looks like the yoke has a couple more windings than usual. Yeah, it does. Probably for the shifting to try to keep the colors, the high-speed switching, and it's probably why it's got its own dedicated yoke board. But this is the board where the chip was replaced on, and the troubleshooting somewhat tried to take place. But I can kind of tell that this thing is very nasty. So I'm going to have to pull all of this apart, and I'm going to have to check everything every little thing so i know where i'm at with this because i already spotted one cap that's still original which is over here that one is still original so that one might be as well yep it is because you don't see any signs of soldering on it so there's just yep um some things were left in when they shouldn't have been so Yep, I gotta go through all of it. Alright, so I've been dry checking the transistors, the diodes, and all of that stuff. I'm, I'm not finding anything shorted or open. I've not checked the resistors yet outside of the fusible resistors because we have three fusible resistors here. They're fine. We've got two of them here, one there and there. They're also fine, so there hasn't been any catastrophic failures. And the circuitry that would have taken out the fusible resistors. Um, I am finding a ton of atrocious solder joints. But that's beside the point. Um, the other thing too is. I checked the transistors and resistors on this board. Or not. Yeah the diodes transistors I mean. They're fine. So this board is likely okay. But I do again see atrocious solder joints like right there. 
That's a problem. That's got to be taken care of. But perhaps more importantly, I was looking at this board, which is the NTSC Demod, and tuner possibly because there's that's a tuner, but then there's a separate thing here. I'm not sure what that does. Um, but still has all the original capacitors in it. I don't see any signs of leakage. But if this were my set, I'd change them all anyways. And perhaps he was doing that, but he decided to stop to try to figure out the test things before he goes on. I, I don't know. I don't know the history. But one thing I didn't figure out right away is there's two fuses here. Well, that black one down at the bottom is open. It's blown. Um, so I don't know if he was troubleshooting it. And then he blew the fuse without realizing he did, and that's when he gave up. Or maybe the fuse was blown the whole time. I don't know. But before I get carried too far down the rabbit hole, I'm going to pull these transistor, or transistors transformers off, including the flyback. And I want to ring check those and make sure all the windings are intact. Because if, if for some reason there's a shorted turn or something in the transformer, then the whole thing is moot. So I want to at least get that out of the way first before I go any further with this. And then I gotta figure out what to do about this fuse over here because it's gone. And, and with a blown fuse, it's never gonna work. So that has to be replaced. And then I gotta check the transformers and all of that. And once I get all that out of the way, I wanna start verifying traces and resistors. And once I can roll all of that stuff out, then it's either gonna work because of the fuse or it's going to be a problem because this chip is still bad. So and the only way you can get these chip is used on the internet. And these are a known problem because the capacitor goo just kind of like gets into it. So it causes these to fail. And these are Sony proprietary chips. So the only way you can get them is on the used market. And who knows what you're buying. So it's possible he bought bad ones. I don't know, but... The only thing we can do is one step at a time, and that is to pull the transformers and verify that the windings are not shorted and are intact. So let's get that done. So I went ahead and removed the transformers. I also removed this module, which this module is the Indextron drive module. This is what generates your horizontal and vertical drive signals, as well as your color switching signals and stuff like that for the, the beam index. Now... The more I'm looking at this, because I'm seeing screen print partially removed on every IC, and plus I see some marks in here. I think this was put in an ultrasonic cleaner. Okay, the problem with that is, if any of these capacitors were leaking, it cleaned up all of the goo. So even though they don't show signs of leakage, they may have been leaking. But since he cleaned it all up with an ultrasonic cleaner, I don't know. So unfortunately, these caps could be bad, but since all of the goo has been cleaned up, I don't know if they are or not. So, and the thing is, this generates your drive signals, right? So if any of those are bad and you're not getting a proper drive signal, it's going to shut down. So there's also that. There's too many variables here that I, um, I don't know where to start at this point. <laughs> So I guess for I guess at this point I'm gonna have to go one step at a time. And that's the problem when you're going behind someone else that had already attempted to repair something. And, and this is the kind of thing you gotta um keep in mind. I know I said I was gonna check the transformers, but I, I will do that in a second. But the plot just it just gets better and better. So like I said, this fuse was blown, I pulled it out. And it is indeed blown, and that's an 800 milliamp fuse. So it can't power much, um, but it does power something. It's blown. But when I noticed I pulled this fuse out, I was looking on the bottom of the PCB, and there's, there's capacitor leakage corrosion here, and there's some up here, which is awfully close to that capacitor. And I can tell that cap is original. Well, if I look on the bottom side, or well, the top side, I should say, there's like a dark spot here. I got the same thing over there. And there's not enough heat generated from that to be dark. So the only thing that would do that would be corrosion. And sure enough, I look up, up underneath there, you can see the corroded pins. Same thing here too. And it's part of this 386, which is the audio output circuit. So that's what I mean by red herring, right? I mean, since this was run through an ultrasonic cleaner, I couldn't tell those caps were bad. But I looked closer and they're definitely bad. 
So that's why you you can't just run this stuff through a cleaner. You've got to document every area that needs attention before you do something like that, because then you make the work twice as harder, twice as hard for yourself and others. You know, so you've got to you've got to really document everything. So, yeah. Oh well. So and then also, this board here which is connected to this IC there. That's a voltage regulator IC. So um, I noticed there was this, this board here is the worst one out of them all. And I noticed this transistor here. I was checking the diode and it was fine. I was checking the transistor and I wasn't getting correct readings. Well, that's a 2SD774, which is a power transistor. It's open. So that transistor is also defective. It's not shorted, but it's open. And I was looking at the data sheet and it's not a Darlington transistor. So I'm probably going to use a KSC 2690 to go in its place. Or I could use an 1898, which I don't I don't have that one on hand. But I got 2690, so I can shove that in there. But uh, I need to look at the schematic because I want to power this board up independently and check voltages to make sure the IC is even working. Because if not, I'm going to have to replace it too. So I popped the shield off of this thing. And ooh, look at that hidden bomb. Yeah, those things leak. And I can't tell if it was ever leaking because, well, it's been ultrasonically cleaned. But, um, yeah, that's a problem. That's got to go. I've seen this more often than not start leaking on a lot of other stuff I've worked on. So it's definitely going bye-bye. All right. Now I think I can finally get to testing my uh, transformers. So I took the super capacitor off. This is the microcontroller board and clock module because this has got some kind of an alarm clock feature. So this runs all of that. And in order to get to that, you got to get this rear shield off. And the rear shield can be a little bit tricky to remove because they're sandwiched. So the two plates are soldered together. So you have to heat it up and then pull it one at a time. So that's out of the way now. Um, I want to get all of this stuff off to the side and out of the way. Because I want to get my meter out. Now, I bought this at the Dayton Hamvention from Anatech, which was at the time John Bachman and Brandon Bishop. Unfortunately, this person passed away from stupid texting and driving. Um, and I can't believe it's been 10 years since I got this thing. But I picked this up from them. I don't think that company exists anymore. The rights may have been sold off to someone else to make these, but I'm not 100% for certain. But I bought this as a kit from them, and I built it 10 years ago now, easily. Oh, man. Remove that. I'm going to get a battery in it, because I take, I take the battery out of all my stuff when I don't use them for a while, because, yeah... <laughs> Any, anybody who watches my channel probably understands why. Because I don't need another Varta situation. Alright, that's done. It rings. The battery. This, I gotta double check some things because that's... I don't like that. Alright, here we go. Check the power transformer for shorts. I don't see any signs of overheating, so it's probably fine. But you never know. So I'm just going to guess because I don't have the schematic open in front of me. Nope. There we go. Yep. It's not shorted. So that's a good sign. That's not shorted. Now let's check the flyback transformer, which is caught up over here. So the flyback transformer, I don't know what the pinout is, so let's take a look. Let's see if we can figure that out. We have the horizontal output transistor, which is connected to the middle pin there. So I know we need the middle pin, and then the rest of them I don't know. So we need the middle pin here. And let's play a game of process of elimination, shall we? 
Yep. Flyback's fine. Alright, good. I figured it was, but the thing is, is you just never know. Now, this is not a foolproof method of checking for shorts, especially when it's under a high voltage load, right? But it will tell you if there's an, an actual hard short that is still there even when it's not under full current induction. So, we're good. We can move on now. So, I got to get a transistor. I got to get a fuse. And I'm just going to leave this out for right now. I don't have one, but I got to order one. Ah, and then I got to change these two caps because, yeah. Alright, so I took a gander at the schematic. I pulled these two out, and sure enough, they were corroded. They had to go. Look how hot they got. So, I pulled that out. Um, but I took a look at the schematic and vid the vertical output stage. This is all related for vertical output. This is a regulator, and then that's the actual vertical output IC. So now, if we take a look at this schematic here, which is not the exact schematic, but it's close enough. Um, that transistor that went open circuit is this guy right here. That is the ripple filter. So it's like a series pass regulator, but not really. It's like an active... Uh, 12 volt, 11 volt bandpass filter. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I, anyways, the point is that is open circuit. So there's no path for current to flow from here to here, right? Well, if we follow that, that's the VCC to the entire vertical output stage. And I bet you there's probably a way they can sense whether there's vertical output present, because if you look, if you follow the VDY, it goes into this and it goes out so if we follow that all the way down and around town V power V D Y and it goes well actually no there's a yoke huh so that's the yoke there's no way actually yep there where it goes where does it go where do you okay so that signal that signal is picked off and goes right here into this circuitry. Goes into the horizontal. I'm not sure what it does. Oh, there it is. It goes right here. Yep. So I wonder, they're picking the signal off for that vertical output stage. So what I'm, I'm not too sure about this yet, but... I'm wondering if there's a way they can sense that signal and if it's not present, it goes into shutdown. Because if I've got no vertical output at all because I've got no voltage going to the output IC, you're not going to have any vertical deflection. And because it doesn't have vertical deflection, I'm wondering if it's shutting down because of that. Um, but I don't know. So this had the most damage to it, but this is the vertical output in, in its entirety. And yeah, so I definitely have to replace that transistor for sure. All right, it's time to let the magic smoke out because this thing is impossible to service outside of the chassis because every the wires are so short. Everything has got to be shoved up in there in order to connect the CRT in. So there's no easy way to probe this thing like this. You can with it all out, but then you can't plug everything in because of the way these mating connectors are. But anyways, I deoxided all the connectors I replaced that transistor that was bad in there, the two caps on this board, the fuse, which I don't have the fuse at the moment, so I had to uh, make a fuse. So hopefully everything's good. I did not plug the antenna board in yet, so I'm just going to leave that out. But as far as I can tell, everything else is in here, so let's see. It's either going to work, or it's going to do the same thing as before, or it's going to make a bunch of smoke. But hey, you know, got to live dangerously sometimes. Nothing. Nothing. Hmm. Okay. So, totally dead. No, not even a standby LED. All right, so here's what I've been able to ascertain so far. Um, okay, so this is the microcontroller board. 
I was figuring maybe it's bad because the gr the red light's not coming on, which I, it may be. But but what I have been able to figure out so far is pin one and two there. One is a blanking output signal, and two is the CRT on signal, or you know display on is what they call it. That's this signal here. So now ignore this stuff because this is not the same on this particular set. There's some differences here. But the control um, assertion is still the same. So if this is high, this should be running. But if not, it should be off. Okay? So that's that's the key here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug the power in right now. And I'm going to measure this. That's high. So by all intents and purposes, that CRT should be on. Alright? Now if we check the blank signal... It's low, so the screen should be blanked out. But if I reset the power here, I got to be quick with this because of one hand. See how it was high and then it just went low? So the microcontroller is telling the TV to come on, but it's not coming on, so then it just blanks the display. So that is our issue. So right now, is the CRT, according to the status bits here, it should be running, but it's not. So we've got a problem with this power supply. So I'm wondering if we lost this chip. Because this is that one chip in the middle that was replaced. And I'm wondering if it's bad again. Because the owner did tell me that um, it would try to come on and go off. It, well, it wouldn't do anything like it's, like it's doing now. It wouldn't do anything. Then he replaced this and it would come on and go off, come on and go off. And now it don't do anything again. So... I think that got burned up. Um, and it could be because of the, the transistor being bad over here. And who knows what else going on. But it's clearly dead again. So I'm going to have to replace the IC. Now he has a spare one in here. In that, that little bucket right there. So I'm going to go ahead and just replace the chip. Because it's bad. And while I have the chip out, I'm going to check all the traces underneath it. And then we're going to pull out the... Um, meter and set it up on ohms and check the resistors we're going to check all these parts associated with it because here's the thing um there's a 33 volt supply right here well it stays at like 12 volts and jumps to nine when you try to plug it in and that that voltage is provided right here so there's a voltage right here and then that gets fed by this 55 volt signal there which comes off of this but if you look there's the b plus the there's an 18 volt supply here which it's not going to be 18 volts it's going to be 12 volts because there's no way to get to 18 unless this is running but so that 18 volt supply comes in here it goes up and then it comes in and then guess what it's going to go through these two diodes and back out that way so can it because there's the chopper transistor which was replaced so we're going to need to, um, yeah, we're going to need to replace this chip because she's dead again. And that chip is phase locked with the horizontal oscillator too, I'm pretty sure. So it's not like you can make a, a TL494 and just throw one of those in there just to make it work, right? Although, if you're clever with engineering, you probably could use a TL494 in place of this. But there's some other stuff going on here. Like, there's a high voltage protection, low voltage protection. There's another protection wire here, which I'm not sure what it's for. There's some references. I don't know if the data sheet to this is available. But I'm curious if this, in time, because the world's going to run out of those chips eventually. And they're going bad, so what are you going to do, right? So there's our timing components, our oscillator. So I'm curious... There's our feedback, there's a reference voltage, and then there's our comparator, and the comparator output. Just like a 494, so I'm curious if we can use a 494 in place of that, eventually. With some slight modifications. Alright, so I talked to the owner, and he told me what happened. So, when he was, it would come on, and he, 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 he would hear the high voltage and shut down. But then he said he slipped on the probe trying to test something and then it died ever since then. That's why I blew the fuse. Okay, so we know that is the problem. Um, I think that fuse feeds the 12 volts up here because I noticed 
Don't do this at home, folks, because if this thing works, that'll energize and it'll get you. So, anyways, but I know it's not going to work. So, I got it plugged in right now. I'm going to go into voltage mode. And right here, this pin right here is the VCC, which should be around 12 volts. I get a half a volt. That's all I got. But if I measure the 12 volt supply, which is over here, boom, I have it. So something between the 12 volts between here and here is open. So not only did we lose a fuse, we lost something else. So let's look at the circuit. Um, this is the VCC. I don't know what the voltage is supposed to be here, but half a volt is definitely not it. Well, we've got a 1.1 K ohm of resistance here. So this resistor network, 1512 and 1525, have to be open. So I go into uh, ohms mode here, cut the power off, cut the power off, and then we measure from here. Let's see, find a spot from here. To here Let's see what we get uh, a meg ohm yeah it's it's open so we lost the two resistors as well which makes me wonder if we lost the chip um, which I have a spare he did provide one so I can replace that but before I do I'm almost inclined to just swap out the uh, find the bad resistors and swap them out and see if this thing actually works that would be amazing wouldn't it Another one of those cases where I wish I had the right schematic. So, according to this schematic, we got a do we got a dual 2.2k in parallel, feeding this IC from 12 volts. Well, I couldn't read that, and my voltage is low. Well, come to find out, they replaced these with a dual 1k, and they connected it back to the 9 volt supply. So this doesn't exist. This is connected back to here. Well, I had to chase around the schematic and figure out where that was fed from. Well, the 9 volt regulator for that is over here so when of course there's not going to be any voltage there if this is disconnected so that has to be connected back into this so i can get the right voltages so i gotta plug i gotta hook all of this back up and i gotta probe right here again with that connected into the circuit versus what we got going on now so uh, the differences of schematics will have you chasing your tail. So my thought is with the Japanese version of these um, particular units, we need to find the actual schematic and get it scanned in. All right, now that I got the regulator board in place, I can actually properly figure out what the hell is going on here. So, um, okay, now I have my VCC now, which is off the screen. The output signal, dead, nothing there. Um, the trigger signal, I have a trigger signal, which is 15 kilohertz. So we're good there. But if I check the oscillator, it goes off the screen, but there's no, there's no, there's no oscillation. So that chip is bad. And when I say I'm checking for oscillation, I'm checking this RC oscillator circuit here. And there's a 15 kilohertz signal there, which means the horizontal drive signal is present. So at this point, um, we've got a defective chip here, I think. So we're going to need to swap that out again. All right, I got that chip removed. He had a ton of flux on this board. I tried to clean it up because I don't know if it's conductive or corrosive or whatever. It had a weird smell to it, so... I got the chip removed. That's what it looks like with it out of the circuit. It's over there. So now I'm going to go ahead and get another one put on and hope like hell these aren't fakes because apparently that's a problem. All right, so I got the new chip in there. And one thing I noticed right away is as I was heating that chip and soldering it in, it actually smells like cap goo. So these chips are used pulls anyway. So Oh, that has me slightly concerned, but we'll see. In the meantime, let's get this thing re-prepped into a certain way to make this thing quirko-twinkulate.
All right, so I got a dummy load connected to the flyback, which is my tester. Because, yeah, I don't trust that. And also, when I first plugged it in, you know how when you start up a power supply, you hear that little wisp noise like a sound? Well, I heard that when I plugged it in. So I know the power supply tried to fire, unlike before. So now I'm going to probe the drain of the switching transistor. And look what we got. The IC is now running. That chip is good. All right, we are ready to rock and roll. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing put back together. I can't tell if the high voltage is on or not. It's not likely, but I can't tell because I'm in my 30s now and I can't hear that sound anymore. So, all right, um, we'll go ahead and get it put back together and we're gonna try it again. And this time I saw the little red light come on and go off. So I think we might be, we might be good now. So I'm going to go ahead and get it put back together and then we're going to try to fire it up again. All right. Well, here we go again. It's either going to work or it's going to blow up. Do we get anything? Yes, we do. It works. Oh my God. It works. It works. Oh my God. So there's the casualties right there. Alrighty then. Man, I love that site. Now I got to figure out what to do next. While this thing is running, one thing I'm noticing right away is the color is off. Like if I do the on-screen display... Well, it's getting better as it runs, but you can kind of see it in the camera. See the color tinging? Let's do a channel up, down. These buttons are really hard to press. See that purple? And you got blue and purple together. Yeah, that something's not right there. Um, I'm wondering if the rest of the caps that are in the Indextron board is bad, and it probably needs calibration adjustment. But I'm not entirely certain on that because I don't know, I'm not familiar with Indextron and how it all works. Also, there's the sensor board in there. There could be caps in that sensor board. So, it's a really good question. You know what, did I plug that board back in? I thought I did. Oh, let me check that. It's weird, it's like I'm missing green. But it's kind of there on the OSD, but then it turns yellow. Yeah, it's weird. There's definitely some issues in the Indextron circuit, that's for sure. we got to figure that out. Which, I don't even know where to begin yet on that. The only thing at this point is it has to be the rest of those capacitors that are in the NTSC DMOD circuit. And then the Indextron control module that's in the rear there. Because the OSD is generated from the um, CPU card and directly in, and it goes directly into the Indextron circuit. So, and the Index, the, the OSD has green, but then it shifts to yellow. But NTSC is missing green completely. So that's a separate issue altogether. So I think at this point, I'm going to need to order up the rest of the capacitors or if the owner has all the caps have them sent in to me or we'll figure something out but in the meantime um i might as well go ahead and until we figure out what we're going to be doing um i'm going to go ahead and end the video here and then we'll come back to this and put the new caps in it and then try to recalibrate the color circuit if we can so anyways thank you for watching if you like this content don't forget to hit the like and subscribe and all that fun stuff and until next time, guys, thank you for watching.